Hello, and welcome to our very first episode of Keep On Cyber Trucking. We're here with Chase and William. My name is Eric. Just wanted to have you guys introduce yourselves. If you want to go first, Chase, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Chase. I've got a cyber truck that we've had since uh, the reservation we put in uh, day one. We actually had the reservation in before Elon, uh, or before they threw the steel ball and broke the window. So that was a fun little uh, re revelation there. But we ended up getting our reservation come up uh, in December 8th. Uh, and it came out pretty quick because we're I'm in Austin, Texas, so if it like we were first to deliver, uh, we took possession of it on February 13th, and yeah, now we're here in in Austin under the the name tag Cybertruck ATX uh, up on Turo. So now, yeah, good to be here. William, hi, uh, I'm William. I got my I originally placed my. Cybertruck reservation for the for the the dual motor the night of the um, webcast. So uh, you know, and I had already had I already had two Teslas by then, so I was already fully fully sold on on the vision. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, this thing is so weird. I dig it. Let let's see, let's yeah, what's coming. Um, and so then I got I got the notice after they started the employee deliveries. I got the notice on December 9th that I could do the foundation series. And at first, I was kind of reactive to the deliveries because there was i don't know there was something kind of annoying me how elon just kind of seemed like toss the keys to people and say peace out and i'm like oh this is either going to be amazing or it's going to be like the dumpster fire of all times as far as as far as car releases so i was like this is amazing and i, I i'm so fascinated by tesla anyway i was like oh i'm in i'm in i'm let's do this so i did the foundation series order on december 9th and then uh, I had a VIN number on January 11th, and then a delivery date on February 1st. Oh. So you mentioned that you had – do you still have those two Teslas? No, I still have uh, the one Tesla that I had mentioned at the time uh, in 2019. I still drive that one. It's a 2019 Raven Refresh Model X. Um, and I also have a 2021 Model Y that my wife drives. Uh, but before that, I had a 2017 Model X 75D. Uh, and that was kind of my my entry into the foray of of Tesla, and really kind of blew my mind. <laughs> well, you just went straight to the top. You just went straight for the X. <laughs> uh, I, it was one of those because I mean, it, you know, back in those days, it was literally just the Model S and the Model X, and I was looking at them in in I think summer of 2017, and those were your two choices. And I had ridden in a Model S, and they're they're amazing, but they weren't uh, they weren't able to to satisfy what i needed for for cargo capacity and the model x was and the the honestly the the falcon wing doors were a game changer for loading equipment and stuff in and out of a car so i was like all right let's do this so and what about you chase did you did you have any teslas prior or even electric vehicles that's a great point because i actually put in the reservation before really test driving a tesla in general uh, it wasn't until after that I was like, okay, if we're going to make this serious, I need to get serious about the Tesla ecosystem and kind of get my feet wet. So initially, uh, I actually rented on Turo uh, a Model 3 to drive from uh, Austin all the way up to Kansas City to see some family to see, okay, uh, I think a long road trip is a perfect way to get a feel for a car and just kind of feel like, okay, how's charging going to work and all these other you know, ins and outs. Uh, and I think that trip sold me for sure. And then actually last year, uh, we were kind of getting tired of, of the weight and we uh, also were just down to one car. So like, okay, let's get two cars, but kind of found uh, a company called uh, Autonomy out of California. And they were doing uh, short-term rentals and they wanted to expand out to Texas and they were running a bunch of ads out here. And I'm like, okay, right time, right place. Let's, let's call them up. And uh, their prices were actually at the time lower than what Tesla could was leasing uh, Model 3. So I was like, okay, this is a win-win. So we, we, we rented a Model 3 for the uh, whole year and had it. Uh, we, we went ahead and bought the um, the charger for the garage because, you know, in our house we already had planned for a car charger. So we were like, okay, let's go ahead and get that. And honestly, being like, you know, 20 minutes away from the closest supercharger, they, it never was an issue. Like charging day-to-day -day driving, all of that was, you know, pretty seamless. And it really sold us on, okay, Teslas are definitely uh, the way to go, if not EVs in general. And then, so when you guys, you guys both both watched on Reveal Night, right? Online. Yeah. Um, yeah. Number one, what appealed 
to you? What, what made you tune in that night to see the Cybertruck? I can go first. I, initially, I was interested in, in Tesla in general, but at the time, I also had an F-150. So I'm like, okay, you know, I want a truck. You want a but truck. But I love the EVs. And I heard that, okay, there was a talk about a, a, of a, a Tesla truck. I'm like, okay, this is going to be interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, once I saw it, it was just like, okay, this is something unique. And then I'm not afraid to like, just kind of jump in on an opportunity. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's do it. Like hundred dollars refundable. It's a no brainer. It's an easy decision right there. Yeah. What about um, you, William? So I, uh, I mean, I had been driving, I had already, that was actually the, yeah, the point that I had just my, my current 2019 model, uh, model X. And I was just kind of in that spot where I was like, man, they've got the model S they've got the model X. I don't, I can't think of anybody who's taking battery electric vehicles in, you know, in 2019, I couldn't think of anybody else taking them seriously. Like BMW, I had been shopping around considering, oh, maybe like BMW i3 or the i8. And I'm like, the one looks like a smart car. The other one looks like a smaller car birthing a larger car. It just looks, you know, <laughs> and none of them had the range that made me think they were taking yeah. it seriously. They were all yeah. sub 200 mile range. And at a time that I just bought my my 315 mile range Raven Model X, I was just really curious to see what Tesla was going to come come with next. And I'd seen all the renders online, and they were all like just basically looked like uh, like Dodge Rams with LEDs. They just yeah, they looked like yeah. the craziest like low effort uh, uh, visions for what Tesla would do. And I'm like, no, let's see what happens. And when they drove that thing out, I'm like. Oh, okay. It was it was exciting, and to say, and 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 I mean, I've been around for long enough to know enough uh, uh, automakers unveiling a car that just, you know, to quote, um, to quote the guy uh, Marv from Sin City, just modern cars all look like electric shavers. And so when you finally <laughs> saw a company who's just shooting the moon, when that car came out, I was like, oh, I want that. That looks awesome. That's gonna catch your eyes, and. It was at first glance, I was like, it was a Tesla battery electric that looked rugged, but had cargo space that I would be able to use for my, my day-to-day work. And so I was instantly like, okay, this I'm going to definitely put in the pre-order. I'm going to see what happens. And then from then it was just the waiting game. So my experience was a little bit different than yours, William. <laughs> I went into it, same reasons I, I, as Chase. I, I have trucks. I've always, I love driving trucks. I like the utility of a truck. Um, we had a Tesla Model 3 at the time. And so I loved electric vehicles. So when I heard Tesla's coming out with a truck, I was all about it. And when I was watching that night on reveal night and they drove that Cybertruck out, I was ready to throw something at the screen. <laughs> because to me, I'm going, what are you thinking? Like, what is this? Why? Oh. Just I think do you can, like a, a normal truck, you know, something cool, it's, but a it's normal five, truck. Right. Like it's like, it's like five years later <clears throat> and I can still feel that air left the room when that thing came out. You're just <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I've talked to some Sorry. people that were there that night and they said the same thing that when they drove that thing out, everybody in the room was just like, is he serious? <laughs> is this a real thing? Or are they just messy? Is this just a troll? The biggest yeah. troll ever. And um, <laughs> so that was my experience. I still put the $100 down, obviously. Um, I think their website actually crashed. When I woke up that next morning, I had like four or five reservations. Uh. Um, <laughs> it canceled the ones I didn't need. I looked at them all, and I kind of figured out which one was the uh, earliest. Uh. And I canceled the rest. And then I just kind of kept you know, my eyes on it and, and looking at it online. And as news came out, I kind of sold myself on, all right, it's cool. And then obviously when I took delivery of it and I was looking at it, I go, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. This is awesome. Oh, you just said like how the, the, the air was sucked out of the room when they see it in person. Like I, if, every day, like if I'm driving down the road, it's like, I see someone that's never seen it before, probably never heard about it. They're just like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah. know what to make of it because yeah. it's just really is just kind of redefining what a car looks like and especially what a truck looks like. Yeah. You know. I think I think the comment I probably get the most was it looks way better in person. 
Exactly. I hear the same that's, thing. Yeah. That's what so many that they, they they say pictures and videos do not do it justice. In person, this thing's cool. So, so I have I have a theory on that if you'll if you'll humor me for a second. So of course. I think that I think that people um that you know, they see photos of it or they see they saw the video online of it and there's something to be said about um I, I you know, I work in, in uh you know the film industry so it's like you know as far as cinematography as photography is concerned when you when you photograph a mirror or something ultra reflective you don't get that same feeling as if you're in front of it like you 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 photograph something that's reflective and that's it it's it's a still frame and i think a lot of people see photos of the cyber truck and they're like oh okay makes sense all right but when you stand in front of it and you just move and you you can see the way that that stainless steel shimmers I think that there's something that's lost in all these photos that it's like, if you can see one in person, I think that that's the first step to being like, okay, okay, this is something different than what I, what I thought beforehand. That's a, that's Everyone a great uh, perspective, you know, because I, I didn't even think about that, but you have that, you know, insight. So that's, that's awesome. Now you guys are actually doing something totally different than me. Um, you guys have, each one of you have your cyber trucks up on Turo. So I yes, kind of wanted to talk about your experience with Turo. Um, who's kind of renting it from you guys? What are they telling you? Kind of just give us and give the uh, watchers and listeners um, your experiences so far on Turo. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let you go first, actually, because you had it up before I did. Uh, funny oh, story okay. with that is he... William helped me out actually getting it up on Tarot because uh, when I first tried, I couldn't. So it's very yeah. interesting. So, okay. So the initial is, um, you know, once I had the VIN number and as soon as I had the car in the driveway, I, I set the business plan in action, which was to get it listed on Turo. So when you first try to list on Turo, you know, you add in a VIN number and using the VIN number, it was not resolving to what kind of vehicle it was. So you would get this error, error screen where I couldn't find the maker model based off the VIN. And so I contacted their support initially and they were just like, oh, give us two or three days and we'll get back to you. So, and that didn't seem like it was going very fast. So I was a bit more, I was a bit more impatient. So I contacted the online chat and I just said, I'm having a problem, but they sent me an email where I had to send them like 12 photos, very specific photos. You have to, you know, put in the VIN number. You have to furnish them a lot of information. And there's a part of me that thought maybe Turo was being proactive, knowing that there would be so much interest in this in this vehicle that people might try to, oh, yeah, I've got a Cybertruck. Let me toss a fake VIN number into it, get a reservation, you know, defraud a few people before Turo catches on and then bam. But you know, it turned. I think that it was genuinely that they just weren't prepared for it to be to be in, available yet. So they they quickly got back to me and they were like, "Okay, you're yeah, we're really excited to get your car on here." And and since I had been through the process and I saw Chase was kind of struggling with it, I was like, "Oh man, I can see how this would probably take anybody like two weeks to sort through this un, undefined customer service blob." So I just I just contacted him immediately. I was like, "Look, they're going to send you an email. Send them all the information." Blah blah blah. But I'll I'll let you <laughs> let him talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Where like I initially uh, had the same issue. I called them. The first representative didn't understand what the issue was and didn't really have a, a solution for me other than I guess just wait, wait for the vins to get updated. And they're like, maybe the system just needs time. And I'm like, okay, well I'm I'm here. And then I'm sitting twiddling my, twiddling my thumbs and trying to find another solution. And it was able to get the right info, contact them right away. I said, hey, this is exactly what I need to do. I've got all the information. Just get me in contact with the, the right support. Uh, and then they got uh, emailed me the next day. And then they were like, we just need all this contact or all these photos. Sent them out, everything. And then honestly, it turned what we thought was going to be like a two to three week process within like three or four days. And we were up on up and live. And it was it, it really changed a lot of the things we were doing because we, we had plans for obviously the grabbing the outside, uh, doing like certain promotional things and like it just kind of like sped up all of that uh, and got us uh, up and up and running right away. So it, was, it really worked out really well that way. Um, the only thing that was interesting, we also talked about um, was pricing. So I I knew that we were going to put it up on Turo right away, no matter what, because of um, because of the increase, and especially after the Foundation series, we noted that they were raising it another 20k. So we're like, okay, the only way that it really makes sense is to, to treat this more like a business and kind of 
go about it that way. Um, so we knew we were going to have it up on Turo right away. So I was watching to see if Turo would even accept Cybertrucks. Like, that was the big unknown. Like, this whole process of, like, sitting on this thing for, for years where, like, we could have got right at the finish line and Turo was like, we don't want to deal with the, the insurance. And they just said no. <laughs> so I was like, uh. So, but it wasn't until January of this year that we finally saw, I think the first one I saw go up was in L.A., uh, and it, I noticed it from Reddit. Someone was like, oh, it's up on Turo. And they were asking for 1000 a day. And then yeah. another one went up in LA for 1400 a day. And then that was very even uh, indicating of like what was going to happen here in Austin because the same thing happened. Everyone went up, put it up for 1000 a day right off the bat. Uh, and then uh, January and February, it kind of started to slowly come down. I think there was only like three or four trucks on, on Turo in in Austin and they were hovering around that $800 a day mark. And I was telling William, I was like, yeah, they're, 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 they're renting it. There's, there's strips there that they're renting it out at this price. And then the week that we get ready to put ours on online, uh, another one came up and dropped the price. And then everyone just started going shifting all around. So now it's, it's covering around that like five, $600, you know, price point per day, which is still pretty good. Um, and it still makes it honestly still worth it for us to keep it up because if we can, have it pay for itself at the bare minimum that's that's the goal right there that's a win yeah 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 it's that kind of the same i mean obviously you know he was tracking prices in los angeles and i was i was looking all over the place i was like okay somebody surely has thought to to take it to vegas or you know or just all throughout the state and it seemed like there was this huge spattering of of trucks that weren't being rented because everybody had this had this ultra precious price to it, and I completely understand it. I mean, there's it's absolutely absolutely to be respected, but um, I think that it was just obvious that it wasn't moving at that price. And I yeah, so I was like, okay, you know what? Uh, let's let's see what we can do to get this thing moving. And so I dropped the price um, to about that 500 mark, and it was kind of like. It was kind of like I didn't get inundated with requests, but I definitely felt like there was a healthy, okay, everybody who was interested in possibly renting this truck was now like, okay, I'm ready to go ahead and give it a try. And I'm like, that's that's good enough for right now. And it's just, you know, from here on out, it's just listening to it. But I mean, I did want to say huge shout out to Turo, though, because they initially, I was like, like Chase, I'm like, oh, this is going to be two weeks. It's going to be in level one support. Then it'll be in level two support. And then someone will kick it to level one support. It, it's just that possible, like, come on, isn't anybody urgent about this? But they did seem like they were like once it, it hit somebody's desk, what it was, it did seem like it was resolved much, much quicker. I could easily see it lost in the mix for a while but they were quick to be like okay we got you listed congratulations you know good luck all that stuff it's like oh great okay you guys are taking it seriously as we are that's really that's really encouraging totally yeah it was great to see yeah even this last week Turo had on their main page uh like a big splash that said cyber truck is here and then had like all of the cyber trucks across the united states and um there's not very many cities like you could i could probably you know go spend a month in I don't know, Kansas City or someplace and easily rent it out for the entire month because there's none there, you know. So it's it's cool to see. Uh and honestly the the clientele that I've gotten so far has really been people that are just jazzed about the Cybertruck. They most likely they have a reservation themselves and they're kind of like on the fence to be like, I don't know. Which I think speaks more to that five hundred dollar price point is that uh, if they wanted to put money down right now or say their their reservation comes you know to fruition they're gonna have to put that thousand dollar down not like what we had because i don't know if you guys had to put any more money down when you actually uh, configured but we didn't either like it was just the first initial hundred and that was it so it could if they drive it and they hate it or they hate the attention you know it could save them 500 bucks but uh i mean everyone who's who's seen it in person and driven it they've, they've loved it yeah, it's. I, I think that everybody who's rented from me, um, I mean, I've had a couple of, of magazines actually uh, contact me to rent it to be able to do performance testing or just, you know, something along those lines, or just, you know, just so that their that their their staff is familiar with the vehicle. But the other people who've rented it have just seemed like they were genuinely excited about the Cybertruck and impatient to get theirs because. The other, the, so I've had a couple of, of individual rentals, and one of them um, was a was a, a gentleman who rented it for, um, I think he literally just had it for a day, 
And I was like, okay, well, you know, people want to give it a try or whatever. And when I met up with him and I gave him the car, we got to chatting briefly, which I'm sure Chase will tell you. It's like every every Turo rental is like a whole conversation and thing about the Cybertruck. But talking with my renter, he was like, yeah, I'm waiting on my delivery, you know, this, that. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So you'll get a chance to, you know, drive it before you actually get it. So when he brought it back to me a few days later, he texted me. He's like, hey, I think I left some, I think I left something in the back of the truck. And I'm like, oh man, I'm such a bad Turo renter. I didn't even look in the, in the hidden compartment in the bed. I'm like, oh, dumb. But I checked in there. He had left some shoes in there. So I met up with him and he drove up in his cyber truck. And oh. I was like, oh, that's hilarious. And he was like, yeah, yeah. So he was like, yeah, I got mine. And we just sat there that's chatting. Cool. Meanwhile, my pickup spot is at a Tesla supercharger. So other people were like, wait a second. I've never seen one cyber truck. And suddenly there are two in There's front two. of me. Everybody was losing it. It was pretty funny. It's, and yeah. it's like kind of one of those like unique moments. Like when's that ever going to happen again? That's awesome. You know, <laughs> that is cool. We knew that there was other cyber trucks up on, up on Turo in Austin specifically. And that also drove us to kind of expedite our plans to wrap it. Cause we knew that if we could wrap it, we could be one of the very few up on Turo. That's also, you know, a different color than the base. Um, now granted, I actually did have a, a, a booking that canceled because they wanted the original color for whatever need that they had. So it's kind of can go both ways, but I figured really? we could, you know, at least stand out in the market in a sea of cyber trucks eventually, because that's, that's kind of the risk that I'm kind of keeping an eye on is that over time, there's obviously going to be more and more trucks getting up on the platform, especially in these larger cities and in Texas and California. Um, so eventually that price is going to come down. So how can we actually kind of stand out and keep the, the price a little higher? Um, as well as yeah, just keep keep the longevity because also we're kind of running against the clock with Tesla themselves because who knows when they're going to start offering uh, test drives? Like they've been very limited to even get um, showcase models to different locations to have you know at the, the Tesla locations. Who knows when they're actually going to have enough to also do test drives with? That's a good point. Yeah, that once they do the test drives, that's going to cut into some of that, right? Because you guys are saying it's people who have reservations that are going, I want to drive it before I actually put some money down or follow through with this purchase. And it's a big purchase. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Now, when did you guys decide that you were going to go the Toro route? Was it a plan from the beginning or is that, when did that happen? Well, for for me, it was definitely from day one. It was honestly a part of, uh, so, I mean, it was a part of my decision-making for actually pulling the trigger on the foundation series. Cause I tried to weigh it as a, as a, you know, cost benefit kind of situation. So it's like, okay, I've had this reservation this long. There's a lot of interest kind of, kind of that good or bad. There's a lot of curiosity and I'm like, okay, so I'm in a unique position where I'm being offered this vehicle at a really, really, uh, I mean, I think that I think that to me it took me a second to kind of rationalize the the foundation series upcharge, but the moment I thought about a couple of things which I can I can spell out is I'm like okay so for the twenty thousand I'm like the, my question is a year from now if the Cybertruck is is being sold non foundation series and the found and what if the FSD the full self driving price is is not honored for whatever you reserved it at. So if somebody wants to buy full self full self driving, which is personally something that I believe in, I believe that Tesla is is the, the 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 in the best position to solve that problem, and I think that their FSD is there to do it. So if I was willing to buy it on the Cybertruck, and it's going to be honored a year from now, or it's not going to be honored a year from now, and I'm going to have to pay twenty thousand, fifteen thousand, whatever it is. There's a part of me that's like, okay, but I can get it now a year in advance. Okay, so what gives that year in advance an advantage? And it was the idea of, okay, if they are – I had read that there was a question of is Tesla seeing a bottleneck at the Austin facility for a 4680 cell production? And I'm like, is that something that's reasonably holding back Tesla production? Are they going to be held back by that even if it's not necessarily true or it's something that's that's – it was true, but it's been solved. It's still going to be a few months to rectify itself. So I'm like, if I get this couple, this several month head start on on other people's curiosity about the vehicle, maybe there's some interest in that for as far as people renting it. And so ultimately, it just came down to that exact question: Are people willing to pay 
to experience this vehicle, which will might, you know, in a year from now be completely available to them at a different price point or have different software, but they can have that now and answer questions about what they want to buy. Whereas Tesla, we know is not great at communicating it. So if there's an opportunity to monetize that and in the end have have that curiosity and, and absence of, of PR from Tesla somehow subsidize my vehicle, I'm I'm happy to take the gamble on that because if it's because if I'm wrong, you know, there's an exit path. Tesla could possibly buy it back from me, or as Mannheim Auctions will show you, I could sell it for twice what we paid apparently. But you know, it was it was, it was just a bit basically a business a cost benefit analysis of could I is it worth the risk of of gambling that it would be rented enough? And I said probably. And so far, it seems like it's worked out. Yeah, totally. I'd say the same thing. It's it really just came down to the numbers and demand looks like it was going to be right there to to make it lucrative. Um, I think that the initial, I think it was the, it could have been the Q3 or Q, it had been Q3, like um, uh, earnings meaning that they did, they actually mentioned, they're like, hey, it's probably going to be more expensive than what we said. And they, they were answering those questions like, okay, this is going to be not a $70,000 truck like we thought. Uh, and it's not even like an eighty thousand dollar truck that we initially thought when they initially when they announced it uh, in November, and then it became a hundred. I'm like, okay, then that solidifies our decision. Like, if we need to pull the trigger on this, it's going to have to be, you know, treated like a business. Um, and then the the scarcity, the scarcity is 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 there, and I know we're seeing um, we're seeing production ramp up quite a bit. Like we uh, people are obviously keeping eyes at the Gigafactory, and we've seen quite a few days now where there's 100 plus trucks in the the parking lot ready to go out the door so it is it is ramping up but i'm not sure it's going to be up to you know uh six digit numbers per year for at least a couple of years and then that at least gets us to that one year embargo of not reselling it so like okay this this is an easy easy risk reward management decision here um and then even when we did on December 8th, get our reservation come up. We had the option to go with the Cyber Beast, but in the the email that we got, it said, "Oh, the uh, estimations for your configuration. I've got the the all-wheel drive, the dual motor, uh, was basically December to March. Or if you want the Cyber Beast, it's going to be 2024. So we don't know when. Uh, so I was like, okay, we'll, we'll stick with the one we have, so we can guarantee it, we get it as soon as possible, so that yeah, we can put it up on." on Turo and see see how it can do it itself because i as much as i would love the cyber beast to have the extra you know extra power and everything else with it um i think it was still a better decision to have it sooner than later agreed yeah and this and this cyber beast i'm right there with you when i went to configure i chose the dual motor because i wanted the range and main reason is because i tow right i want as much range as i can get but the appeal of the Cyber Beast is just the fact that it's the top of the line. Um, you're going to get, you know, for me, I plan on keeping this vehicle as long as I can. To me, it's kind of like a, like a DeLorean, you know, type mm-hmm. of thing where it's like a collector's item. And so yeah. in that, when, when you talk about that, you want the top of the line, right? And so I would have wanted the Cyber Beast for that reason, um, but I didn't want to wait. Because the same thing as you guys, I wanted to monetize it. Not on originally, I was thinking about Turo, as we've discussed before. But once I got it in my hands, I got a little nervous, I, and um, so I haven't done that not yet, at least. Um, but I knew I was going to monetize it in some way, and I went. If I wait until the end of 2024, you kind of lose that, right? And so it's it's a little frustrating to see that Vins are going out for the Cyber Beast. Um, I know. Today, actually, being Thursday, the 7th, um, there's a gentleman named David that that took delivery today. And I thought about getting him on the podcast today because we've been going back and forth on social media. But I know he's probably having fun with his cyber beast. And maybe next podcast, we'll get him on here. But um, but yeah, I'm right there with you, Chase. It's kind of like when you when you get that opportunity, you need to jump on it. Right. And it, it's I think we're on the same boat that we just needed to get in and get in quick so we can, you know, well, try to also, push it out. I would also I would also say this considering like like Chase had said, it's kind of a uh, it's it's a vehicle that's uh, or I'm sorry, maybe Eric said it. It was a uh, the vehicle so unique that, you know, you kind of want to plan something for the future. And part of for me part of that is just as simple as as okay, do I need three motors because I have 
two kids in the car and a wife who, you know, it's like that zero to 60 isn't as important to me anymore. So it was kind of that additional, okay, if, it, if I could rent the Cyber Beast at a better rate on, on Turo, and I bet that they do, and hopefully those guys are renting at a better premium. Sure. But as far as I'm concerned, that last little bit was, okay, at the end of the day, this is still a vehicle that I, I, I genuinely am curious about. And that's such a unique thing to say. It's like growing up with such such a boring selection of cars throughout my life, seeing something as iconic as that out in the driveway that pretty yeah. soon anybody could own. I'm just it's just mind boggling to me. So for that reason I wasn't as quite as much I don't necessarily need the cyber beast. It might be a little overkill for me. There's just something fascinating about the aesthetics to me that I'm just like I, I could look at this thing for a long, long time. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I I have for reasons that you you hit on. I have two kids. I have a wife. Uh, I'm not driving fast. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm older now. I'm not trying to uh, race people on the freeway, even though people are trying to race me when I'm on the freeway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I have no interest in that. But it, you know, for the collector's reason, the cyber beast would be kind of cool. But other than Literally. that, I I I don't care. Um, but you know what, William, you did bring up the foundation series and kind of breaking it down and looking at the full self-driving and what that might cost at whatever point. And that $20,000 premium that we all paid and justifying it, right? We wanted it in our hands sooner. Um, yes. there's, there's, uh, you know, the full self-driving, there's different things that are included with that foundation series. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you guys feel. Um, is it value? Is it not value? Um, you know, let's talk about that. Well, I mean, uh, for for me, like I said before, the foundation series being the price that it is, I'm like, if if FSD is still twelve or 15000 by the time that the, that the non-foundation starts selling, I'm like, Okay, so there there's seventy five percent of the cost practically soaked up just initially. It's something I would have bought initially, but it gave me a year's advantage on other people trying to rent it necessarily. Um and then on top of that, I'm like, all right, so it said the power share hardware, which, you know, I haven't I haven't seen a, a final price point on exactly what the, the Tesla Energy Gateway could be. So we'll say two thousand dollars. I'm like, that just it just whatever those little things were that move the needle close to okay, the foundation series really it just seems like I'm getting my truck earlier than a lot of people at a premium that I was already willing to pay. And I additionally get the laser etching, but I don't get to choose the interior uh trim lines. It has to be white. But otherwise, it seems like my same opportunity, just I'm paying the premium of it happening sooner. But I really am curious to see what the FSD price is going to be. Because if it's if it's 15000 in 2025, when people start are able to get the non-Foundation Series version, I think that you're going to have, have some a couple of days of anger. <laughs> At least. Same for me. Having full self-driving was a big factor into the cost as well as the power share um power share and then as well the um like the four thousand dollar credit and that's something we can get into when we talk about power share a little bit more which is kind of bittersweet um but that was kind of where i was justifying okay this makes more sense it's like they're giving us they're throwing in the things that i typically would be probably paying for anyways just right off the bat um, exactly. So it, it's it kind of comes into that price point where you probably would be spending about a hundred anyways for the eighty thousand dollar version. So uh, I think the only way to, to get around that is like if I I could take or leave the full self driving right now. Like I like it for the highway, like the the um, the driving itself on on that. But like the, the streets, I haven't gotten enough to, uh, time to to practice it yet. To, to really say for sure, like, okay, this is the future, but I'm curious, still, still open to it. But it's also a big price point. Like, um, I remember when I bought my uh, F-150 back in the day, uh, it was kind of the same same deal when you went from uh, two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive. That's a, It's a big justification because it's, it's, you know, $15,000 more for the same truck, but it's four-wheel drive. And that you have to kind of weigh those costs of like what what are you actually going to get out of it? What are you going to use it for? And kind of figure out from there. Now, do you, do you, either one of you guys have power walls? I do. Okay. So for me, I've been thinking about getting power walls for for a while now, and so when they announced the power share feature of the Cybertruck. 
that's where I, I looked at the foundation series and I go, uh, you know, it's justified more than justified because I was willing to buy one or two power walls and have those installed. And now I'm getting a truck that is my power wall. So I'm getting a truck, I'm getting power walls. I mean, it's, it's a win-win for me. And so for, yeah, for me, it was a, it was, it was a no brainer. I, I was okay with it. I didn't care. Um, I felt like the truck just itself was um, going to give me a vehicle and the uh, backup power if I ever need it. And, you know, they could have charged me probably even more and I would have still done it just because it was, it was like a bundle. Yeah. So I, uh, I, yeah, I think we should. <laughs> let's get let's get William all riled up. They are a <clears throat> massive battery backup that can sustain any number of homes in a major power outage or power disruption. And the idea that right now it's a premium, I'm like, yes, the sooner it becomes normalized, the better. Because I could see in five years from now, everybody just being like, yeah, I, you know, I have, have a car that I just plug in at home and it literally keeps my house powered throughout the day. And I go to work and I charge off my boss's power and drive it home. Whatever you do, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I can't imagine, I don't know how we've gotten this far into electric vehicles as a major, major addition to the, uh, the fleet worldwide of personal transportation without discussing the fact that you're sitting on a battery that could chart, that could power the average household for 24 hours and then drive you to work. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I think it's just absolutely amazing. And it's like, yeah, it's inevitable. But it's like kudos to Tesla for giving it a name and making it kind of a, a thing that will usher in that interest. Because like you said, Eric, it's like you were shopping for power walls and now you've got a car that's effectively 10 power walls. Yeah. And it can go it's... 0 to 60 in 4.1 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's it, it's a no-brainer, right? I mean, it just to me, it, to me, it just makes too much sense. And, you know. Okay, so when I presented it to my wife, when I got the email, she was like, no. Why? Number one, she didn't like the looks. She's like, it's ugly. It's hideous. Why? Why do you want that? She didn't understand everything that we're talking about, right? You know, yeah. The cool factor, the <laughs> monetizing it, you know, just everything. So when I broke it down for her, and I go, this is why, you know, power walls. And I'm doing my, my convincing she finally just went, okay, well, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. So just, <laughs> just, just go ahead. So, you know, but, but, but it's true. That's what it boiled down to. I'm looking at it. I'm going, it makes too much sense. It makes way too much sense. And I mean, I'm happy with it so far. But yeah, let's get into the PowerShare hardware. Um, I know William has a lot of, look how he, you see how he puts his finger on this? <laughs> I'm chill. I'm chill. Where I mentioned that, like, the power share was, you know, a big kind of factor in the, you know, justifying the cost. Um, but I think the biggest one, the biggest revelation in the last week that I have realized is the, the difference. And I feel like the, it's not, it's kind of scammy, but it feels miscommunicated, maybe on purpose, is the, the difference of the four thousand dollar install credit because I initially when I heard when I read about the PowerShare I'm like oh yeah PowerShare plus we're gonna give you you know four thousand dollar install credit and I read that assuming that all of the Foundation series you know the dual wheel and the tri motor were getting that credit turns out that credit's only for the Cyber Beast so we both pay the premium but we don't get four four grand to go towards you know install now granted I've heard depending on your situation and depending on if you already have like a dedicated 240 volt line for charging anyways, it, you, your install could be, you know, six to $8,000 anyways, but at least helps. I mean, in my case, it 4,000 would have covered the, the entire install. Like there's nothing, you know, more that they would need to, to charge to, to get ours set up. So that's kind of bittersweet in my mind of like, okay, if we do want to install this, it's going to be all out of pocket, but take possession of the hardware that we've already paid for. They won't give it to us. So, teed it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I would say initially, so the first the first concern about the, the PowerShare hardware is kind of like, so the PowerShare hardware, I feel like, is just 
them saying that you're from what i understand it's it's you're, you're getting the the tesla energy gateway the new version or the newest version of it and the ultimate i'm sorry the uh you, the universal uh wall charger um which you know kind of kind of tinkering with some of the stuff on my own it's like okay so i've already got the energy gateway and i've already got uh, uh i already have a wall a wall charger but not the universal one um so I'm like, all right, but if you're going to include those things with the Foundation series, like you said, I'm like, okay, I get maybe the Cyber Beast. You're just trying to entice people into doing a little loss leader action to try to get somebody to buy the Cyber Beast at the Foundation series premium. That makes sense. Fine. But if you're going to say that you get power share and the power share hardware, but then you're like, but wait, I need to charge you $4,000 for me to deliver it to you or 1200 or 2000 that starts to kind of irk me a little bit. Because knowing a little bit, the, uh, well, I'm being nice. the 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 bigger thing to me is just it. it well, yeah, I'll, I'll just try and tone it down. The you know the car itself is capable of delivering eleven. What is it? Eleven point two kilowatts um, yes. discharged at two twenty um, out of the out of the bed. If you yes. were to if you were to hire an electrician to just literally do a um, you know uh, uh, I think it's positive plug to positive plug, which normally you're not supposed to do because people get electrocuted but you could run that to plug it into your house and literally create a a, 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 f a failover backup device and you just leave the truck on and then the moment the house if you have a fault the grid fault or the, the, there's an outage then a manual or, or there's a manual switch but a default switch it switches over there's nothing technologically so advanced that you need to put it behind a four thousand dollar paywall to get the equipment that you're effectively buying for the foundation series it just seems like this last ditch effort to kind of honor what seemed like Elon's disappointment with the notion of Tesla going the route of vehicle to grid and vehicle to house charging or discharging. Um, and it's kind of one of those things that I'm prepared to, I mean, I've already, I moved into a house in 2020 and I, I relocated a Tesla solar system with me and I learned a lot of things about Tesla energy. And one of them is that there's nobody at the helm of that ship. Or at least there wasn't in 2020. It was really remarkable, like the in my inability to get this problem solved. It's just getting my equipment returned to me to be installed at this house, let alone having it installed. I eventually got it completed, but it did kind of teach me that it's like, and when it comes to this Tesla Energy Gateway equipment and the power share, I'm willing to bet that some electrician bringing stuff to my house will will put the Tesla Energy Gateway in my garage, and then I can say, okay, now leave. Just go ahead, get out of here. <laughs> and I feel like he probably would. I don't. I, I mean, yeah. I'm willing to gamble, and I just be hey. like, I'll even, I'll pay you an installation charge, but just leave it there. I don't, I don't need you to put it on the wall. Just leave it there, and I'll pay whatever invoice you send me up to what we estimated. You know. If you don't mind, when that day comes, let me come over. I want to film that. <laughs> <laughs> we do it like, uh, like Paranormal Activity cameras in the corners. You know, and like, see me go. No, but. Universal Charger is on their website now for six yes. fifty, so you can, you can buy it. So I'm, that's kind of interesting. And they, I mean, they obviously they don't have the the, the other piece as well. But gateway. So yeah, I'm curious to see the gateway. I'm curious to see what how that, that shakes out because yeah, we I just like I said earlier, I just had a, a text from the the one you know electrician that's uh, certified by by Tesla that we can't can't shop that around either, which would be nice if they would just give us you know deliver the hardware let it take up space in my garage and let me take possession of what i paid pay for it you know? exactly that's the problem right you when you're looking at the list of things that you get with the foundation series it says universal wall connector it says gateway it says bottle opener it says this 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 right and yet they're not giving them to us I, I thought I was going to get arrow caps. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> I've, I've received no communications. I took my I took my truck in to to get those corrosion and rust spots that I was like I didn't know what they were a month ago. I brought them into the to the dealership, or so, sorry, to the Tesla service center, and I spoke to the the manager just a day ago, and he was like, "Yeah, we ordered you a whole new uh, front side driver side panel," and I'm like. I didn't know I needed that. I thought you guys were just going to clean the outside with barkeeper's friend or something. But apparently they they were like, no, we decided to just order the corner. And part of me was like, eh, I, may not, I may not keep this appointment after all. But 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It just seems like there's a lot of disconnect around this truck, which is again, kind of that, that November 30th, Elon just starts tossing the keys to people be like, Hey, what's up? I love Reddit. Nice. Hey, nice to meet you, Serena. Here's the key. Uh, yeah. you know, whoever here, here's another key. Just the fact that they just kind of did that and it's just blah. And then, you know, and like they put up a couple of placards, uh, at the, at the, at the show showrooms, they're acknowledging it. The employees in the showrooms are like, yeah, it's cool, but they don't tell us nothing about this thing. Yeah. It showed up a week ago. We weren't told it just, Hey, here's a cyber truck. I just think that it's just so interesting to me what's going on there. And the fact that it's all bleeding over now to the whole, okay, I've had this truck for over a month and they're like, yeah, you're going to have power share someday you know or or we're not even going to acknowledge the fact that it doesn't come with autopilot or full self-drive there i mean we've gotten all of our information from rumors like is that the way that a company who's selling a, a truck at this price point would ever operate but with tesla it's normal and I, I don't know. I just feel some days I just feel like I'm just front row for a Jerry Springer it's automotive uh, <laughs> production, and I'm here for it. I'm just I'm just loving it because nobody else <laughs> forget the drama. Nobody else is making a car like a Tesla. No. Yeah. So yeah. I just we're, we're all do, we're all in Elon's world, and you know yeah. we're just we're just living in it. And I don't know but about you're... you guys, but my wife is super mad at me. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> she, she saw it and I was like. Okay. No, my wife was the same way at delivery. She looked, she looked over at me and she went, "This is cool," you know. So, so then I was like, oh, "Okay, all right, all right, I'm good." I know. But, I know uh, you, you, you drive it around. Kids are going nuts. It's like you can't oh, deny that there's something there for it already. You know, it's yeah, awesome. Yeah, kids go crazy. Kids go absolutely nuts. Guess this, when we first brought it to the neighborhood, uh, literally the entire neighborhood came over. Uh, and it was like the entire evening, afternoon. It was just like one after another. Everyone was just that's phenomenal. This. And someone was like, you know, if you came home with like a new F one fifty, nobody would give a shit. Like nobody no, would no. care. But like the fact that this is something new and you could even I, I would bet you could yeah. even bring a McLaren home. And oh, after yeah. the first people ten like, or fifteen oh. minutes, people are like, okay, it's a small car, cool. Yeah. But they, yeah. that yeah, it's the truck. It's crazy. Kids loved yeah. it. Like the school bus, uh, the first time it came by, it actually stopped. Because it's just like all the kids must have went crazy going, at the school bus. They were just like looking at it, and then they the, went on. The after kids a few took minutes. over the bus. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> they were like, "We must stop." And then it's what's cool is that like our our neighborhood is really really close knit. Like we've got a Facebook group. Where everyone keeps in touch. Like oh, cool. I, I just put out a post uh, this every every week on Wednesday. Our Facebook kind of consolidates all solicitation to only Wednesdays, like Business Wednesday is what we call it. And I did a post obviously for the Turo, and people were like. Our kids love it. We love seeing it driving around the neighborhood. Like so much, of, you know, really good support, and that's that's it's nice to see because that's cool. There's a lot of haters online, but I've only seen the haters online. Like I, I don't know if I told the story, but the yeah. only one hater that I've seen in person uh, was a, another guy driving the opposite way on the highway with a with with the bird out the out the window, and he was honking the horn. That's just so crazy. I, he noticed that I, I could see it. I'm like, okay. He went out of his way to do that. Just think about that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gotta let that guy know. I disapprove yeah. of his super truck. It's, it's like, come look at my finger. <laughs> I, I, I think I told you guys my stories, right? The two stories uh-huh. that I have, where my parents took the cyber truck down to to make the little wine country, and yeah, same thing. Guy was flipping them off, um, and then the time that I was doing my road trip video to Arizona, and a big rig just tossed his drink out and splattered the whole windshield and. Imagine yeah. getting so worked over, worked up over a car. I don't right. understand. I mean, that's kind of the other thing that I was like, okay, this, this is going to sell itself. Like the, it kind of tied into that business decision. I'm like, the marketing is embedded. Like yeah. everyone's going to look at it. Like are we, even this evening, uh, we we have it because it's not being rented out tonight. But we took it to you know downtown and we just parked it in valet where no people are going to watch it. And the fact that we've got like our you know stickers and stuff on the outside, so they know where to find us. Like we've Absolutely. got a QR code on the outside, so it goes straight to our Turo. It's just free marketing. People yeah. people turn, they look. It's it's just crazy the, the amount of attention it gets. It's a billboard on wheels. Yeah, completely. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So. Completely. It's got flat uh, sides like a billboard too. <laughs> like put, it I've really got, like, does. A big magnet, a, a big like fridge magnet that, that's got our like our credentials on it. It says red meat <laughs> on the outside. Nice. So when it's parked, I'll put that down. Nice, nice. Well, you brought up William uh, the corrosion. So yep. 
on the on my rocker panels, I have corrosion stains or marks. And I've put in I had a laundry list of service requests. Um my Tanu stopped working one day. Ooh. It just the buttons it was no, no the Tano didn't stop working. The buttons on the outside to control the Tano stopped working. You okay. press them and they, they wouldn't work. So I, I took a video of that, sent it over to service. They said, we'll go ahead and fix that. But then when the first software update came out, it fixed it. Yeah. So I don't know if that was a known issue or if it I reset think it was the, a the key computer. authentication issue because I had a similar issue where I tried to, I, I also, I so I came at my, I walked up to my truck in, from my garage. I didn't approach it near any of the pillars. And I've always kind of wondered where the Bluetooth range sensitivity is for the phone key and i came to the back of the truck and i tried the i tried opening the tanu as well and it and it did the same thing it wouldn't open for a few moments and i'm like what the heck so i walked around to the side of the the, the door and i opened it and i got the door open then i walked back and hit the tanu and it opened at that point so i was like i wonder if they're already having some sort of like a, a service identification problem or something like that with spotting the bluetooth key at the right times or if you know it's it's all the it's all the software stuff that again alludes to were they ready to sell this thing to me or not but let's let's learn together let's find out <laughs> oh i think i think that's tesla's thing right they just push the car out and they go we'll fix it later yeah you know get it in people's hands it satisfies satisfies uh the public and then it's almost like the community knows you're going to get an unfinished good but we'll mm-hmm. finish it later and we keep buying them. So. I, well, so I, I think it's like everybody keeps joking around about how Steam uh, has allowed publishers to do the whole early, early, uh, you know, early access games, or it's an early beta or something, and then these games literally never exit beta. They just live their whole lives yeah. as a work in progress. And I think that that uh, the the for a four dollar game from Steam. You know, you can accept that, or even up to like a sixty dollars game. People are consumers are obviously willing to accept that. But Tesla has revealed, no, no, no. You can literally buy a, a five five decimal places worth of a car, or five, you know, five you know five figures worth of a car, and and you can still be like, don't worry, guys, we'll fix that in the software. Yeah. And people will just be like, yo, I'm gonna drive this home today. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just give it to me now. <laughs> but you know, it's like, but I also that's how think good that they are. That it is, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, you had to find, you had to determine that about your consumers because you have other people who are like, yeah, I've got a, I've got a Ford F one fifty or something where this button on the dashboard that turns on the hazards still works, it still does the same thing from when it left the the dealership, versus my car downlight downloads a Christmas light display every December, yeah. and so I feel like there, yeah, you're there, there's 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 you know give and take with it. I think you know you're getting. You're getting some cool features, but some of them might have, you know, might have had the intern coding it, and he needed to have his code reviewed by somebody who maybe knows a little bit more. And they're okay. Hang on, let me fix that. All right. So like the last two, the last two bug fix software updates for my Model X have just been literally just bug fixes, just said yeah. minor fixes. So yeah, that's yeah, that's what they do. King <laughs> just came in for tomorrow. Nice. nice. Changes my plans up a little bit because I was going to take this. I mean, it's it's a. I, I keep joking that it's, it's a good like, problem to have. It's Chase. a good problem. To have. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is this is nothing to, to be worried about. And yeah. what's funny is that because personally, we we were like I said, we were down to one car, um, and we uh, we had my wife's car that she had since she was 16, and it was just kind of chugging along. We had already sold my truck previous, so we're like, okay, we're waiting for the Cybertruck. Uh, and uh, we still didn't know when. We put in the order in December, and then her car just hit the bed in January. So we're like, okay, now we're really like on the cusp. We've got to figure out something. So we ended up having like a, a temporary vehicle for a little bit before we could finally solidify the truck. Once we had solidified the truck, then we got her something because it was like we had we we knew that we were gonna do this, and we didn't want to like jeopardize getting the truck first um, with like another vehicle purchase or something else. So. But yeah, it's car. It, the car issue has been um, interesting in the last few months, but it's it's thankfully it's it's worked itself out. <laughs> yeah. uh, you bring up a good point about the the rust too, because we were talking about um, the the theory about what what was actually happening, and I think it's kind of more known now 
uh, after all of the you know the news buzz that everyone's like, hey, these these trucks are rusting. You have mountain rain. They, rust they get, Well, yeah, you can, they're getting rust everywhere. But it's like I think everyone realizes that no, this is raw metal and it's it's porous, so it's it's collecting material from the road. Like you pr- probably see it. Like I I washed it before we wrapped it, and by the time I got it home, there was still gunk on the the outside of the. the, the the truck because of the road it just picked up just grease and random random stuff so it's definitely picking up stuff that is then corroding but yeah like barkeeper's friends seem to be pretty solid even on my side to like pull things off as well as ammonia free glass cleaner that's been pretty pretty solid to get it off but then it's not to mention the the difficulty it is to even just get it off like it's not easy to clean it takes you know a lot of elbow grease to get and that's the biggest takeaway that i had from the shop uh, bespoke paint protection here in cedar park texas that they they were saying absolutely if you want to keep this clean or even hope to keep it clean you're gonna have to wrap it because they they had to detail the outside before they put our wrap on because it's transparent so it needed to be like perfectly clean and that took like a good majority of the time and that was and that was the main reason why i wrapped mine is i had it for less than 24 hours and you know obviously you're showing it to everyone and fingerprints and you know just getting dirty and uh, me kicking it <laughs> and you know it was just like uh, my ocd kicked in and i go no i i can't do this i, I gotta go get it wrapped and you know luckily i found a good shop mike's tent shop and they wrapped it for me and i love it and i'm happy because my kids touch it kids i mean i'm sitting in the car sometimes and waiting for my kids to get out of school or they're at the park or whatever the case is and i have kids just walking up to it touching it knocking on it just you know but i feel like it there's a layer of protection there that I, you know i don't worry about it anymore so um that was the main reason why i did it is just to kind of protect the the vehicle and lower my stress level oh yeah fair especially renting it we knew for a fact that there was no way after i started cleaning even just a little bit i'm like this is going to be too much work to just keep it clean and yours is uh, PPF, right? Yeah. So now, yeah, like, so. once I got it home, I just I was running my hands along it. Like it's so nice. Like, it's nice and smooth, yeah. and like, yeah. no fingerprints. It's PPF, uh, and it's it's interesting what we did. We actually did like a um, it's Steck product, so it's some of the best PP, PPF you can get. Um, I kind of was doing a little bit of research, but this one looks great. Like people can like bang on it with. Um, a screwdriver and, and not really dent it or, or scratch it. Doesn't much. do anything. Um, so it's really great stuff, but it's also actually uh, it's dyno smoke. So it's not actually uh, meant for wrapping vehicles with. It's meant for wrapping your headlights to tint the headlights because oh. it is transparent. And the guys at the shop when I brought it in, I was asking them, "Hey, what, what ideas you have? Like, I really would like to do matte black because I like the look, but I know that it's also very popular. Like, it's completely sold out on Tesla. I know eventually people are going to have a ton of matte black ones, so I just wanted to stand out. And they came at me with this, and we, we took a piece and a sample of it and put it on there. We're like, okay, this is actually going to work out perfectly. And because it's transparent, it shows the Foundation Series logo through it, as well as like the, the steel grain. So it, it kind of looks cool. It's like if you would go to a Home Depot and you see like a black stainless steel refrigerator, that's kind of what it looks like in person. So well, speaking of that, we want to have a segment on our show that where we talk about the wrap of the week. And I went rogue on you guys. Um, let me see if I could do this. Can you guys see my screen? All oh, right. So recognize one. <laughs> so this, this, this so trip. this, this is the wrap of the week. I love it, man. I yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah, that's hot. Seeing that logo through, like it, it's interesting because it's not as dark as I was expecting. I, I thought it was going to be more like black and glossy, but the more I see it, the more I like it. Knowing which wrap is this? The, uh, this is what I said: the Steck Dino Smoke. Yeah, okay, so it's like that translucent, it darkens it, but it's not... Yep. It's uh, a tint, essentially. Like, it's a, so a full-color tinting. Um, I, yeah, I'm I, sorry, I see so many cyber trucks getting posted with lighter <laughs> colors, and I yeah. just, I, I'm like, you know, good for you guys, hope you're happy with it, but it's just, I think that it just does it a disservice. I think a darker color just makes it really look hot. Totally, darker colors for sure. 
as much as I love the matte, I actually think glosses it looks really cool. Especially at night, it looks it looks amazing. Yeah, um, no, this it's got some plans to uh, actually. So you can see there the comment ATX Batmobile. I've got uh, some plans with him to uh, to shoot, shoot some content. He's another uh, Turo host here in town that has uh, quite a few like blacked out cars, and he uh, is our local Batman. <laughs> and you know, so, people tell me that um, my car looks like the Batmobile. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. From Dark Knight, everybody. Yeah. yeah, I've heard that. Between between the the yeah, the Batmobile or the Tumbler or whatever they call it from Dark Knight and mm-hmm. the APC from Aliens, you know, with the really yeah. big wheels up in the front. Yeah. As soon as I say that, usually they're like, "Oh, I can't unsee it now." But yeah. Yeah. But yeah exactly. That looks really really good. Well, yeah. congratulations, I'm still, I'm still Chase. Naked. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, Damn. naked is cool. You know, I mean, I, I get naked every so often, I, but. I, <laughs> <laughs> I still got my my semi my semi hopeful plans for because um, I'm gonna still do the protector bright as soon as I get the truck back, but um, I'm really interested in trying to consider having somebody paint it, not not paint it like a paint job, but like paint yeah. it like a mural. Because I'm like you know it's a, such a unique thing, and I'm like oh if somebody could really do a really interesting mural on it, I think it would be really stand out. But then I don't know what that would do to the Turo rentals. But we tested the, the Steck products. What was really interesting is with a Sharpie. So they like oh. would draw a Sharpie line. It, it's like almost like the, the Sharpie ink like just dissolves. It doesn't even stick to it at all. Oh, it's oh really? really wild. Yeah. It's, so I would definitely highly recommend Steck product. We, we also Steck. did uh, Steck, okay. Steck as well for the uh, – we did a front window tent, um, which was kind of cool because they, they said that the rolls for that tent only come in rolls of like 60 inches wide, and the window at the width is at 59 inches. So it was just one giant piece mm-hmm. of – a film, film that they had to very carefully i don't even know how they did it because they they also had to like put it in from inside so they were like they must have been crawling up in the dash to even reach mm-hmm. it because like i try to put in our like registration sticker up in the dash i, I, I could barely even reach it <laughs> so i can't yeah. imagine with the uh the film that windshield is wild absolutely wild i'm waiting well, for somebody to make a, a, a cockpit display or a, a hud for it because it's like it's just this huge piece of glass that I'm like, if you put if like you could put like a a 40 inch television in there and, and and skew the perspective so that it would hit the reflection right, and then you just have like you know Google Maps or Waze right there on screen. <laughs> it's so massive. It is. That would be actually pretty cool, <laughs> right? Um, I think that we need to talk about today's big announcement that is non Cybertruck related, but electric vehicle related. Um, we need to acknowledge the Rivian. Definitely. So R- Rivian today announced the R2, and then they blew everybody's mind by revealing the R3 and the R3X. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share also some of their... So right here, this is the R2. And yeah. so it's it's essentially a smaller version of the R1S, um, targeting the Model Y. I think William, I think it was William who mentioned that's like a Rav4 size, yeah, Toyota Rav4. Um, William, you put a reservation down. I put a reservation down. Um, why don't you tell us why you reserved it? So, um, I. Uh, I've had a rule for myself for the last several years, uh, especially when it comes to tech products. Um, I really like I really like and prefer working and buying products from companies that clearly are indicating that they're here to play, that they're here to make something that makes you think, hmm, I wish my car had that. Mm-hmm. Tesla's done that every single vehicle I've ever owned from them. So I'm I'm a I'm a loyal fan of that brand. But Rivian's one of those brands that I feel like I feel like they have carved out a nice little spot for themselves. Because I remember going to the LA Auto Show um, probably like, I, I can't remember how many years ago, but I saw, um, I think it was Bollinger, their, their yeah. um, Ford Bronco looking kind of really that rugged. That thing was cool. That thing was so cool. And that it looked cool. like it, it could drive through concrete walls. I mean, the thing was ultra u- ultra utilitarian. Like it had that pass-through that goes from the front all the way to the trunk and beyond. 
it just it had it had thought out a lot of things that I was like, okay, this is for people who don't who aren't into luxury vehicles. Suede doesn't impress them in the car. Nobody's making electric vehicles for that, and, it, and and this market of EVs will not take off until they start competing for other people's interests. Not everybody mm-hmm. wants to drive a car that looks like a Model Three or has the capability of a Model X or even a Cybertruck. And I think that Rivian has done a great job being like, it's awesome what you guys are doing. We make we make vehicles for people who like camping, who like off roading, and and they do it casually, but it's still something that they identify with. And I think that the R2 is is a good looking product from a company that's really showing. Everybody else is talking about cutting back on EVs. Everybody's talking about there's no demand. Yeah. Ford's reducing EV production. Oh, is there really still interest? Tesla stock is dropping because nobody wants EVs again. And then you got Rivian coming out literally saying, yo, we're going to make a smaller version of our other car. And we even had some spare time to make another car that's also going to definitely get, capture some interest, you know, because they are cheaper or more affordable i guess is the better way to say it and yeah. they answer certain segments of the of the uh, market where they're like okay you know what i need something that i can take camping with me because i like taking the kids camping on the weekends or whatever it is and that's where they that's where they're here to play and i and i respect the hell out of it and you know i i like the look and the and the the shape and the capability of them i like the cargo space i like the height of the vehicles compared to compared to the model my, my wife's model y and so I'm like, okay, in a couple of years, if I want to change out to a model, uh, to a, a Rivian R2, I've got the reservation in. My kids are going to be taller, so they're definitely going to want to be able to get in and out of a car that's a little bit more their their height or whatever. And I just, I, I, and this is one of those unique moments where it's like, you know, I'd rather throw a positive vote behind a company like Rivian to to be the competition that Tesla and that market needs because they don't mm-hmm. just need Tesla just making cars and everybody being like electric cars. Now nah, it's just Tesla making electric cars. Mm-hmm. No, I want to see more. I want to see more competition. It's got to be in the form of designed deliberate vehicles that they, they think people want to buy. And that requires dedication to it. I think Rivian has it. To the model three. We said we all had families, and that was kind of the difficulty thing with the Model 3 is that with a rear-facing car seat, especially a full-size car seat, it gets really tight to, to get in yes. and out of that, that back seat. So I felt like that was kind of like the, the really the need that the Model Y does a better job of it, and Cybertruck obviously is great to get kids in and out because there's so much room. But then, you know, you're not going to have any, you know, soccer moms going out looking for the Cybertruck because... You know, different different tastes there, but yeah, I think the, the Rivian is definitely going to hit that market right in the middle, where it's got the utility, it's got the space, uh, and it's an EV. I think that's that's huge. And so it's an EV. It. I think it can't be understated. You said it, Chase. And 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 the stats and the features on it are just amazing. I mean, a zero to sixty in under three seconds. I'm sure that's probably for the tri motor version, but still, you know, the other the single motor and the dual motor are going to be quick. Um, it has, it's under, it's 45,000 starting at 45,000, which I think is an amazing price point. Um, it's luxurious, it's spacious, there's cargo room. I love the windows, how the quarter windows in the back vent out, um, for ventilation and how the rear window slides down. Um, I mean, I love that. It, it just, to me, it's, it's the perfect family vehicle. Um, and and yet utility, right? It's I'm sure it's going to have all the capabilities as the R1 series with off roading and um, you know all the adventure because they kept talking about adventure, um, yeah. all the adventure capabilities. I mean, it's to me, I I was I was all in. Um, and then when they revealed the R3, I thought that was super exciting because I love the way that that thing looks. Um, let me bring that up real quick. That right here, I mean, even from the backside right there, that's the R3X. That's a beautiful little hatchback, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Like a miniature version. Yeah. I th- but I also think that there's, I think, I think we're getting fooled a little bit by these photos because I'm like, how, it's because it's like, I think it's obvious the R1 is the R1. It's got three rows in the R1S and it's a, you know, a truck for the R1T. The R2 
you know, shortened a little bit. I don't see a third row or even the possibility necessarily. I mean, it's got a, a little trunk space, but it's still those two rows. And then I see this one, the R3, and I'm like, okay, it's two rows, but I'm like, but it doesn't have the trunk space. And it doesn't look, it's, it looks like it's apparent in the R2. And I think that this is supposed to be like a little bit more sporty. It looks yeah. like it's supposed to be a little bit more of a, more of a, you know, an off-road quickster. Like somebody can have it for fun, but it can also be the the Subaru WRX on the weekends or something like that. Yeah, see that photo right there, that one, that one. It just looks so slim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like the yeah, it's got a surfboard like hanging out the back in that one <laughs> shot. Somebody saw that photo, they're like, "Don't use that one. Don't use that photo." And then they did. <laughs> I yeah, just it's just so these, small. These and did you catch? Oh, sorry. sorry, do you see the the charge? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's the Tesla. That yeah. seems to be the the charge everybody's port. like, uh, what? No <laughs> charging <laughs> ports only go on the left side. Rivian yeah. let you guys to into our superchargers, and you thank us like this. <laughs> <laughs> They're trolling them a little bit, I think. You know. <laughs> well, so I'll, I will say this, and it'll, and I'll tie it back into like electric vehicles. We're driving around these batteries that can that can collectively power cities, and it, you know a lot of cars park on the street. A lot of mm-hmm. a lot of cars get parked in front of their house, and and getting a cord that's long enough to go around the back end of a bumper versus if you're parked in front of someone's house, or if you have street parking in front of your apartment. If cities start getting on board with doing infrastructure where they they pay you to plug in your car at night so that you can be available to back up the grid and major outages, there's an incentive there. And it means that they can just have a nice shorty cord right to a post versus having a long one that they got to maintain and someone's going to come along and snip it for the, for the 30 cents of copper that's in it. I think that it's actually a pretty forward-thinking thing that probably – I think that Rivian was smart to be like, yes, we will accept the the NACS as our charging as our charging future. However, I do think that there needs to be a public conversation about, okay, but shouldn't the charging plug be on the other side of the car? Doesn't that serve the greater the push to transform all of our fleet from gas vehicles to electric better? If if it's available as a, an added good, so I think that Rivian probably did a smart thing, kind of forcing the hand in that. I'm curious to see what Tesla's response will be. Well, there does, definitely needs to be some type of universally known, or all automakers just put the charge port on one side in one exactly. location and just be done with it. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Some gas cars with- yeah, no more like which 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 side is the goddamn <laughs> pump on? <laughs> but I mean, really, I think a lot of these automakers are are feeding off each other's insider info, and but I I'm very kind of curious about uh, Tesla's next uh, economy car because they they've talked about the the next one that's going to be coming up is going to be more of a smaller, uh, cheaper price point. I've heard maybe like twenty five thousand, kind of like kind of going for the European market, but it would make sense if that also was a hatchback. So I would be curious to see how this R3 and the next Tesla are going to kind of compare. Because it would be smart for them to not just make a tiny car, like, you know, like a a Mini Cooper or something like that, but like a still functional sized, you know, hatchback would be nice. Exactly. My My question is, how much of the Model 2... If that if that's what it's called, that's why my brain went to it. How much of this of this lower cost vehicle is going to be decided by the idea of is it going to be predominantly robo taxi, or mm-hmm. is it going to be is it going to be something for people to buy to operate as robo taxi and the other thing? Yeah. Or just I'm kind of curious because I'm like how if you're going to do that much of a price reduction, what are what's going to be the change? How are you going to support that kind of reduction in cost for the vehicle? to be able to compete at that point. And th- my immediate thought is like, okay, if like a Honda, the cheapest Honda Civic right now is like $23,000. And you're saying you're going to make a battery electric vehicle that's going to compete in this space for 25,000. You're going to convince me, A, you found a way to make it super cheap to manufacture or B, you're expecting a part of the subsidy to come from the software you guys have been 
touting for how many years? So how, is it going to look like a personal conveyance? Is it going to look like a, a Mini Cooper? Or is it going to look like one of those weird designs where it's like literally two seats in this long looking weird thing? Because it's designed to be more of a just a person a, a conveyance that's a robo taxi, yeah. not necessarily a hey, get into my you know my Honda people Accord. mover. Yeah. Do you yeah. think? Do you think they would? I know this is getting down another rabbit hole, but do you think that they would, um, given that they're putting more features into the base Model Three, like they're they're putting the larger screen that we saw with the Cybertruck, they're also putting in the rear screen as well as the dynamic light ring. If you think that they'll obviously not do the extras, but then try to go as, as base as they could, maybe get away with doing a full screen in the middle and then go back to having you know screen in the dash. Um, I will say one thing. I do think that Model 3 and Model Y starting to incorporate the rear screens is, again, uh, Tesla thinking that they have a robo-taxi future. Because I think that that's, if you're going to have people sitting in the back seat um, and you're going to reduce the reliance on a front front glass or whatever, then it makes sense to be able to have a rear screen where the where a customer can interact with a credit card or uh, uh, type in an address for the vehicle to take them to or something like that. Because not everything will be relied on the app in an Uber fashion of me getting into your car and me making sure you know where I'm going. More of a, hey, there's a fleet of Model 2 sitting here and we need to get down to the Luxor Hotel and we're at uh, Mandalay Bay or something like that. You know, they're across the street. I know that now. But, um, you know, the you know, you basically be able to just get into the car and just tap, 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 tap. Okay, credit card, quick. And then it'll just take me there. So I think that the integration of the rear screen, I think that we're, we're – um, I feel like the idea of having a rear screen kind of shows my age being like, oh, my God, I would love to be able to play video games in the back of my car. But nowadays when, when LCD screens or, or OLED screens or whatever, they've come down so much in cost. That it, to me, it's me me thinking that it's like, okay, if they're going to bother putting that in the car, it's probably because they think that they have a future of co- customer interaction from the back seat, which means some sort of robo-taxi or some sort of, of passenger dictation to the front or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Show, speaking about showing our age, there's no way in heck I could sit in the back seat and play video games. You know how dizzy I'd get? <laughs> 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 well, I tell my son all the time. He's on his iPad for like an I don't hour know long how drive, and then and then he like looks up and he's like, "I don't feel well." And I'm like, "Gee, you think? I think I know why, dude. Look outside. Like every 15 minutes, just change your focus." But oh no, I couldn't do it either, man. Yeah, yeah, it's I I can't do that kind of stuff. I I just look at my phone for two seconds and I'm already dying. Um, <laughs> Coming home from dinner tonight, my wife actually was sitting in the back just watching YouTube back there. So was she really? We to, yeah, we wanted to test out. Uh, I think she tried it earlier with uh, the kiddos in the back and, and had some issue with the audio. And it turns out like you um, uh, you can turn it on when you're in park from the from the main screen, but while you're driving, they have to control it from back there. But you can also switch the, the audio source if you want it to be the rear or the front. Uh, and I think that by default, it uh, changes the balance when you switch to the rear to be like the audio in the back. So if you really want, it, which is nice because if you don't want to hear what they're watching, it, it actually the balance is really really spot on. Um, you don't hear it that much at all. But if you do, you can just move it. Obviously, yeah, my kids are addicted to YouTube and they just listen to it in the back or watch it in the back. And I'm like, here, go enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope they're subscribed to my channel. <laughs> I'll check their subscriptions later. <laughs> Are you on YouTube, kids? Or... <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I, before we wrap this up, I wanted to do another segment that I want to incorporate onto our podcast, which is we talked about um, what were they thinking? I want to just uh, get your guys' thoughts and insights on. The crazy things people are doing to their cyber trucks. So these guys right here <laughs> took a baseball bat and just started going at it. What I love though is you can see here a bit about how the bat starts to bend. Like <laughs> yeah. the bat's breaking before the truck does. <laughs> yep. The look at it right there. He's showing it. <laughs> But see, I feel like the, Although, I feel like the only fair thing would have been if they went over to like their own cars that are, were not cyber trucks oh, and yeah. beat them with a baseball bat exactly. and see how much damage. So you actually have some point of but, some point of reference. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. there it is. Bent, he bent it. 
<laughs> I think this is the same guy that I saw today also shoot it. I, this must uh, be the same truck. And they shot it with metrics. 9 mil. And I, everything was going fine until they hit they hit the back panel, the one that kind of encompasses the back wheel. And they had two penetrations in the back panel. But it didn't go all the way through to the bed. Oh, it's really? Interesting. Yeah, they because which is interesting because in the original you know promo video they only shot the doors they kept it kind of only around That's the true. doors so they were doing the same thing and then eventually shot two two at the bed and then it went through so are we thinking that maybe the 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 doors are are probably a little bit thicker a little bit thicker since there are passengers directly behind them, I imagine that they're probably reinforced in a different way that makes the stainless steel panels more effective to impacts versus the back where they're like, yeah, no one's supposed to be sitting in the back. So, you know, someone can shear that off and make it a crumple zone or something like that. But yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I Part of me is like, I want to know if they did damage the door. It's like, okay, so how much would that have cost to repair versus how much they've monetized that video to be? Cause, exactly. I mean, that can't that can't, can't be a good be. idea, man. There's no way. There's no way. Well, Plus, they just like, is that to... really a metric that you use to shop for your cars? Be like, I need to know this thing can take a baseball bat and a forty caliber Tommy gun. <laughs> Yeah. You're like, why? You're like, yeah. my in-laws are real annoying. Yeah, know. I was going to say, like, who's really going after you? You know, if someone's yeah. really trying to go after you, they're bringing a baseball bat and a uh, right? nine millimeter. I mean, <laughs> what did you do to them? Yeah. So, you don't understand. That, yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Well, I think uh, for our first uh, podcast, I think this went really well. Um, I appreciate you guys doing this and agreeing to do this. And I'm excited for what this is going to bring for us. And, you know, gives us a forum to talk about all the Cybertruck and, and other things. You know, we don't want to just have exclusive to Cybertruck, but, you know, that's the topic. And that's something that we all own a Cybertruck. So um, we get a lot of questions and forums and different um, things that we're part of. And so I feel like this was important for us to have a way that people could ask us questions and we could answer them in video form and we can share videos and, and different things. And so, um, successful first episode i think and for anybody who's watching you could leave a comment or hit us up on our um, instagrams or different um, social media for a wrap you can submit a wrap of the week um, nominee also send us crazy things that people are doing to their cyber trucks or any vehicles or anything crazy that people are doing and um Chase, William, go ahead and let them know what your guys' um, social media is so they could reach out to you guys. For my vehicle. Uh, but you can reach me. I think I'm at, at WilliamD314. Um, and I'm sure we'll we'll have links available to you. As well I'm gonna put links. Like, yep. I'm gonna put out. links all on the yeah on the description. I'll put it put it down there for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> all right, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And cool. uh, to the next episode too. Yeah. Let's do it again.